again, everyone. And it would be okay if you said good morning. Good morning. <laughs> what a smile. Uh, all right, good to, good to be here. Good to have you here um, this morning in 2 Corinthians in chapter 9. Preface this just a little bit before we start. Um, all of us who grew up, in denominational assemblies, we were taught uh, the principle of tithing. And we were taught that um, you're responsible for giving 10%. And, you know, you get into 10%, you get the debate, is it 10% of my net? Is it 10% of my gross? If I get a gift from somebody, do I give 10% of that? Uh, if something were to happen and I get this, do I give 10% of that? And it just goes on and on and on about the tithing. Um, and so let me preface what I'm going to say that when I talk about free, we're free from the tithing curse, okay, because there is a curse associated with tithing. There's a curse associated with the law, and that the law says to do it and you're blessed, and to not do it, then are you cursed, right? And that's what the teaching is. So maybe we should look at that one verse before we go any further. Look at Galatians 3 real quick. And so that we can establish the curse part of this thing. Uh, because you're free from any curse of the law. The law does not have dominion over you. Anybody know why? Because you're not under the law. You're under grace. Romans 6 and 14. Okay? So there's no part of the law that has dominion over you with the ability to curse you if you don't perform such. Because you're not under it. Now I know that this is a prevalent teaching because I can turn on my radio during the day and I can listen to preachers still telling people who are Christians, who if they have trusted Christ and His finished cross work, they're Christians and they're preaching to them that they can be cursed if they don't tithe 10% of their earnings. I know that's still prevalent out there because I hear it. And there's a couple of them that are really dogmatic about it. But look here at Galatians 3 and 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So according to verse 13, Galatians 3, has Christ, has He redeemed us from the curse of the law? So that would mean that there is no do this or else, right? So that doesn't apply to the church, the body of Christ. That is covenant Israel when they were under the law, with God, under the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, it was either do and be blessed or don't do and be cursed. Okay, So we understand that by all of our previous teachings that we're not under that program. We're under grace, freely given by the work of Christ on the cross. It all comes through Him. Don't think for a day that anything that you have in this life spiritual is because of you. Everything that you have in this life spiritual is because of Jesus Christ and what He has done for you. Okay? So it's never you. You cannot brag of one thing. You can't boast of one thing of what you have in the flesh as if you got what God has on your own. It's all through His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay? By grace through faith. As you received Him, so walk ye in Him. You got Him by grace through faith, you walk in Him by grace through faith. All right? And just realize that you're not able to do what needed to be done. If so, then Christ would have never died. All right? So then now that we know that we're redeemed from the curse of the law, let me say this as another argument. The tithe was a part of Israel's law. And then they go, well, Abraham tithed Melchizedek before the law. So uh, tithing was before the law. Well, so was circumcision before the law. Do we need to look at that verse in Galatians? Right? He said, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you how much? No. Nothing. So we're not under that law either. Do you realize you can't break the law up in pieces and divide it out and say do this much or that much? No, it's all things in the law that a man who do them, who does them, he must continue it in all those things, right? And guess what? You can't do it. So then let's get on with the message, right? So what we want to look at this morning, I want to look at the tithing principle, and I want to look at how the tithing principle does not apply to the church, the body of Christ. Now as I say that, I will never teach, and the Bible does not teach that we should not give. 
Okay? Because we should. Okay? We should give to the cause of, of getting the work of the Lord done as the way He has laid it out through Paul and being ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors for Christ, teaching and building on the foundation that He gave Paul as the master architect to build up on that. We should give to that endeavor. Okay? So don't ever think that I say don't give. Because sometimes when you say things like we're not under the tithe, then people say, well, you don't give. Yeah. No. And I'll just be honest with you, since way back when, because tithing was one of those first lies, yeah. spiritual lies that I was told that I called on to before I ever come to Right Division. I realized that I wasn't under a tithe way before I got to Right Division because I could see the teaching of the tithe. And I could see who it was taught to. And so I didn't quit giving. I just didn't tithe the way I was taught to tithe back there when I was, you know, when they were twisting the scripture for me. So it was one of the first things that opened my eyes that something was wrong. Because you can't give as you purpose in your heart freely, not of necessity, and have it to be the same as a law of giving, right? Those two things aren't the same. All right, so let's read here. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. For as touching the ministering of the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you. That first verse when he said it's superfluous for me to write unto you. Paul says in this word superfluous would mean that it really would not be necessary. It wasn't, wouldn't really be beneficial for me to write unto you any further if what has already been established has not already been received and believed. I'm just writing to you in vain now. Okay? But Paul knew the minds, okay? So therefore he said it would be superfluous if I wrote unto you, Father, basically, just, just continue to beat on the same thing. What do tithers do? They beat on the same thing over and over, right? So he said it would be superfluous for me to write unto you, for I know the forwardness of your mind. See that? So what's already been said, you're already forward to do. So it would be superfluous for me to continue to write about the same thing. For which I, I boast of you to them of Macedonia that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal have provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf. That as I said you may be ready. Lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. Uh, that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren. Notice that doesn't say to extort the brethren. Okay? This is to exhort. Okay? Uh, that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. The word bounty here in the scripture means your liberal giving, your liberal gift, your gift given. Out of generosity is what the word bounty means in the context here. Okay? This is not dog the bounty hunter. Okay? This is the bounty, the liberal giving. All right? Whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as covetousness. Okay? But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, verse 7 is going to be our key verse that we want to look at because there's some words in here that we need to distinguish and we need to understand how this is working. Every man, according to his purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace. Notice this. Now, watch what's going to abound. Sowing sparingly, reaping sparingly, sowing bountifully, reaping bountifully. Watch what's the, what's the reaping here, okay? And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. You see that? Okay. That ye always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. So the reaping is the grace and abundance to be able to do all the good work, okay? This is not TV preaching. You plant one flower and you get 100 flowers. That's not what the, the scripture is talking about. Okay? If I plant one flower, I'm expecting how many flowers? Right? They teach you, you plant one, you go out and you got a field full of them. And this is not what the Bible is teaching us at all. 
All right, now watch. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. And we're going to stop right there. So if you really want to understand what Paul is saying in these first nine verses in 2 Corinthians, you need a little, a little homework. And I'm going to let you do that on your own because I want to get into this and go to the tithe and show you how it differs from Paul's teaching. Go to chapter 8 and read all of chapter 8 and see Macedonia's heart and see their forwardness to give. Okay, And what Paul is doing in his ministry, because of the agreement in Galatians 2, when he said not to forget the poor saints that were up at Jerusalem, not to forget the poor, and Paul said this I was forward to do, that he was going to help those Jews who had given it all up. And what Paul does is, is he visits these churches that are Gentile churches. What he's doing is he's taking up a bounty in order to help the poor saints at Jerusalem who had given it all up waiting on the kingdom. Okay, So they're helping the poor that way. And there's one place he says, if you take part in their spiritual things, what is it that you also take part in their carnal things? And that don't mean carnality the way we sometimes think about it. It meant the physical things that they had need of, food and raiment and so forth. So this is what Paul was teaching. But notice in chapter 9 and 1 through 9, there's no mention of a 10% tithe. And by the scripture in verse uh, 7, it's, it's as a person has purposed in their own heart to give, and it's not grudgingly, so the attitude is important in how you do it, all right? And it's not a necessity, it means it's not required, all right? So let me ask you this question. Was the tithe under law to Israel required? Well, we'll just simply see what the Bible says about it. Go to Deuteronomy. You'll be in a lot of Old Testament books today. We haven't been here in a, lot, in a while, but we're going to go back here and look at Deuteronomy. And the tithing principle... The way I've studied it, the way I've been taught since I came to Right Division, if I truly believe if people in churches would understand it from its foundation, I believe they could clearly see that we're not under that program, and they could understand what the program was actually for. And then I want to I want to pat this assembly on its back. Okay, there was a time when years ago we had an assembly and we taught tithing. And I want to say we struggled a lot to pay bills. Okay? We really did. And a lot of those things, and I'm not pinning roses here, they came out of my pocket. And when we walked away from that assembly, I was paying on that assembly for years after I left it. All right? In this assembly here, and somebody might look and say, well, you don't have much. We got all we need. That's right. That's right. Finances have never been an issue. It's never been an issue. It's never been, boy, I don't know if we can go any further because of money. It's never been an issue. People have given out of their hearts. People we don't know have given to this assembly, have given out of their hearts, right? And it's never been an issue. I thank God for that. I have never sat up here one time and I'm not going to start today begging somebody for money. You know, they lay the guilt trail out. Yeah, if you don't pay, we can't have the lights. Well, we'll just go home and do it in the dark. Or we'll do it in the dark here. And Brother Willie can hold up his iPhone and, you know, whatever the case may be. There's no guilt in you to give. And you're not a necessity have to give 10% of your income in the dispensation of the grace of God. Well, if you don't teach tithing, you're going to go broke. I'm already broke. I started this thing broke, right? So what, what's your point? And I'm not broke, and I shouldn't say that, and I thank God for the things that I do have, but it's, it's, it's never going to be a lie told to you about your money and guilt uh, given to you about your money to give to this place. If you want to give to it, God bless you. Should you give to it, if you trust it and believe it, yeah, you should. That's all I say, all right? Now, the difference from giving from a purpose in your heart and not grudgingly and not a necessity, it shows up right here in Deuteronomy 14. And look at verse 22. Now watch the wording very closely in Deuteronomy 14 and 22. And tell me if it says the same thing that 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says. Deuteronomy 14 and 22. Now notice. Thou shalt. See that? That's different, isn't it? Now that's starting to sound like a command, isn't it? Sound like a law, don't it? Okay. Over in 2 Corinthians... Let's just say, for instance, that the law says, drive, and it is purposed in your heart to drive. Now, some people still do that even though there's law, right? 
But you just drove any way you saw fit to drive, however you purposed in your heart. Well, you can't do that. Why? Because there's a law against it. Right? So you can't just back here in Deuteronomy give as you've purposed in your heart, not grudgingly, not of necessity, because there's a law that says you can't do it. The law says, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed. Now notice the seed. Yeah. Not money. No, not money. <laughs> I could have come in here went down to Clemens Mill and picked me up a 50-pound 50 uh, 50 bag of grain and corn and so forth and so on and really showed you the principle of tithing back here. This is not about money. Okay? All right, and I'll show you that as we go. That the field bringeth forth year by year. So year by year, they had to give up the first tenth of everything that they had grown in their crops and so forth for various reasons, and I'm going to show you the reasons. Okay, do you see that? All right, so the law says what? Do, be blessed. Don't do, be what? Cursed. We read in Galatians 3.10 or 3.13 that Christ has already done what? He's already redeemed us from the curse of the law. If He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, that means the law does not apply. That means I'm not under a tithe that can curse me if I do or don't do it. Honestly, if I go to do it, I'm really stepping into a curse program. I know you're way far back. Hold Deuteronomy and go back to Galatians and look at 3 and watch the law at work. Watch the law at work. Now, what I've learned about right division and men who teach right division is they don't just tell you their feelings about something. They go to the Scripture to show you what they're saying. And when you do string... Scripture together, and you keep the two programs separate, what happens? The light comes on, right? It starts to say, oh, okay, that can say this, and this can say that, and they're what? They're both right, but they're not right at the same time, okay? You can't have a law of 10% to be right today if you only give if you purposed in your heart. You can't be both at the same time. But the law of tithing was true to Israel at that time. All right. So watch here in 310 and watch the law at work. For as many as are of the works of the law are under what? The curse. the curse. For it is written, curse is everyone that continueth not in how many things? All things, including what? Circumcision, tithing, and all that, right? So here you see the law at work. So if you want to be working out of a curse system, go off and think that you can tithe and be circumcised and please God today. It won't work. Okay, do you see? All right, curses everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do what? To do them. All right? And in verse 11, he says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live how? By faith. Now watch what the law is not. Look at verse 12. And the law is not what? By faith. Does it take faith for me to tell you to go do something? It's a command or else I curse you. No, you're doing that. Why? Because it's a law. Okay? You're doing that out of fear. Okay? You're not doing it out of faith. You're doing it out of fear. That's bondage. Okay? And that's what these Galatians were taking themselves back to. All right, so we're not here to teach Galatians because we did that this morning. All right, so then what I want you to understand is something about the law of tithing. Look at Numbers. And we'll come back to Deuteronomy. But I want you to look at Numbers. Book of Numbers in chapter 18. I do believe I'm going to have to buy me the biggest chalkboard I ever had. Because I remember teaching this stuff and using the chalkboard. And I'm not good on a dry erase board because my penmanship and artwork just don't work. But on a chalkboard, I think I might be able to do that. 18 of Numbers, I think is what we want. And what you're going to see is the tithe and the first portion of the Lord and what it was for. Because the first tenth went to the Levites. And there's a purpose of why it went to the Levites. And here I think we find it in 18 and 21. And behold, I have given, this is 1821 of, of Numbers, and behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance. Okay? Now watch why. For their service which they serve, 
even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. So the Levites, who had no part and parcel of land or inheritance, they were there to administer the sin offerings, the tabernacle, and all the operation of the tabernacle. They were there to do that on behalf of Israel, okay, as priests to God, right? All right, what do we not have in the body of Christ? Priest to God, right? There's only one man between us and God, and that's who? The man Christ Jesus, right? So we don't have a priesthood. We don't have a tabernacle. Why? Because we're the temple of God, right? So there was a place here where there was a building, there was a structure, and which God said He put His name on, right? And these Levites that ministered to, for the people, unto God, sin offerings and so forth and so on. So the first tenth went to the tribe of Levi because they did not have part and parcel a, a land or a lot, right? So the first ten went to them. Now watch verse 22. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin and die. See, there had to be someone between Israel and their sin and God for the offering up of sin sacrifices. We're not offering up sin sacrifices today. Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. He died, He shed His blood, He arose the third day. Therefore, we have no need for a priest some man, anyone else, pastor, preacher, doesn't matter who he is, to stand before us and God because we have free access according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Right? So the first tenth was given unto the tribe of Levi. Now watch verse 23. But the Levite shall do that service, shall do the service of the tabernacle, of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. See that? So the sin of the people... The Levite stood between them and God for sin offering. And it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. So you can see that. So we'll see things a little more clearly about those passages here in a second. What I want you to see is today there's no Levitical priesthood. There's no inheritance for those Levites. There's no tabernacle for us today. And we do not inherit the earth, okay? And no priesthood, no tabernacle, no sin offering because Christ has done it all for us. Do you believe that? All right. So what does this really truly mean? And why is the tithe so important? Well, first off, there was something that happened annually with these, uh, with these Jews. Look at Deuteronomy 16. There was something that happened annually with these, uh, with these Jews. And... Three times a year, they had to go down and come before the Lord on three, three different occasions. It was Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles that they had to come before the Lord. All right, now watch here in Deuteronomy 16, 16, he tells you this. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. All right, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Okay? So they were required to come three times a year, all the mail. Now you can understand, in Acts chapter 2, when he said there was uh, devout men out of every nation, devout men out of every nation over at Pentecost, right? Because that's what was required. Okay? So the Passover to Pentecost was what? 50 days. So shut down your business, quit doing this, quit doing this, and get down to the feast days in order to do what God instructs you to do. Right? So this tithing thing is wrapped around the nation Israel and how God used the tithe as part of their government system, as part of the family system, and also as a part of public welfare, all right? And I don't guess about that, and I'm not scratching my head over that, because I know that according to the Scripture. So you in Deuteronomy 16, look back at Deuteronomy 14. Remember we started off with verse 22. Now, there is a tithe mentioned in these verses that everybody in here, would they would sign up for it, okay? But... 
Here's what you don't find in churches who teach tithing. You don't find the foundation of tithing taught. Who it was taught to and what it meant. All right? But these verses make it all so clear that all you have to do is believe the Bible. I'm not twisting scripture. I'm not trying to get you to see something differently than what the Bible says. I'm just trying to lay it out in front of you and say, here you go. All right, so you either believe the Bible or you don't believe the Bible. All right? If you believe that you are spiritual Israel sitting here this morning, then you and I just need to have some Saturday meetings. And we need to get you straightened out. Okay? So if you believe when you're reading Deuteronomy that God's talking to the church, the body of Christ, you're, you're just, you need help. If you're in the book of Malachi and you believe that's instructions for the church about the body of Christ, then you just need help. And I don't mean that sarcastically. I mean you need help. You need to understand that verse 1 says it's the burden of Malachi to Israel. And you're not Israel. You didn't become Israel when you got saved. You're not Israel. You are the church, the body of Christ, a new organism in God, spiritually one man in Christ Jesus who was not known until it was revealed to Paul that that was such a man that could come out of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not in the prophecies. Okay? Not, you can't find it there according to um, Ephesians 3, 6. All right? So here we go. Thou shalt truly tie all the increase of thy seed, um, that the field bringeth forth year by year. All right? So that would sound like, if it's all, that that would be gross, right? All you make this week. Back in 22, Deuteronomy 14, 22. So that if all that you make this week, you're going to tithe off of it. That's gross, right? He didn't say after taxes. He didn't say after this has been taken out and that has been taken out. All right. So watch what he says. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thy oil, and of thy firstlings, and thy herds, and of flocks, and thou may learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Do you see money in that? No. And nowhere is it. It's a sad thing about money. But he will talk about money. So watch right here and I'll show you. And if the way be too long for thee, all right, you've got all this product, and the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, so you can't load down the pack mules and you can't load down the horses and the, whatever you're carrying it with, if that's too far and too much for you to carry, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, now watch, then thou turn it into money. All right? See what he says. So then, if it's too far to carry all the product, all that I've asked you to bring, all thine increase, now you're going to change it to money. But watch what he tells them to do with their money. And bind the money in thine hand, and shalt go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Now watch. This is where we would all say, I'm in. I'm in for tithing, right here, verse 26. Watch what he says. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. Watch, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, uh -oh, or for strong drink, huh? or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou and thine household. You know, I've been said that to me, you know, that's the festival tithe. Okay, I like that. But I believe it's also, I call it the family tithe. You know, this is what the family holds back for the family. How do I know that? He just said, keep it back and for whatever you desire, you and your family, if it be corn, if it be wine, even if it's strong drink. Okay, there's going to be problems with that with some people, right? I'm living out of that tithe of Deuteronomy, but mm, know about that strong drink because I'm a Christian. Well, here it was permitted that they would buy with it what their soul lusteth after, right? I didn't say that. The Scripture said that, right? Now, if you say it doesn't say that, you don't believe the Bible or you're not trusting what the Bible says. So that would be the family tithe. Now, watch what he says here. Verse 27. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him. Now what? For he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. So if the Levite is not tied to, he has nothing. Right. Why? Because he didn't have part nor parcel. Okay? Now watch. 
At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. See that? All right, now watch. And the Levite, because he have no part nor inheritance with thee. Now watch. All these people are without. Notice this. All these people are without. All right, for the Levite. What's the Levite without? No part, no parcel, no income without the tithe, right? And the stranger, that would be as a Gentile, somebody displaced, and he's now come up to Israel. He doesn't have a promise of land or inheritance. So the stranger. And the fatherless, that would be people without a father, <laughs> right? And the widow, that would be people without a spouse, right? So all these people are without, which are within thy gate, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied. And the Lord thy God may bless thee and all the work of thy hand, which thou doest. Okay, there's people still living on that principle as if that's what God is saying do. And God's going to do for them as they do this principle. I am all for feeding hungry. I'm also for hungry going to work. And that's not mean that's Bible. Okay, the Bible says if a man did not work, then let him not eat. All right? But I'm all for helping people who need help. All right, so in this, what I want you to see is the Levitical tithe is that which was paid to the Levite for the service of the congregation of the, of the tabernacle for sin offerings. All right? And then we had the family tithe. That's where the family withheld that money or that good for themselves in order to basically have a festival. I mean, folks, if you want to talk about going out and having a picnic and sitting down before the Lord and having a good time, there's your verse. I mean, if you're living in Deuteronomy, you get to do that. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink or for whatsoever thy soul desireth, and thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy household. Everybody is happy because we're having a big Saturday. Right? That's better than a yard sale. You get to keep it, man. Right? Good. Right? So that's part of the tithe. Then I want you to see the last part of those verses from 27 out to 29 would be the welfare. The welfare tax in order for those without to be able to come and have. Okay? And he gives you the list of those people there. So the end of that, when he says... At the end of three years, so they go three years, and they bring forth all the tithe that I increase, the same year, and shall lay it up within thy gates, okay? And the Levite, and he goes on through that list of people again. So those are people that are without, and this is the tithe every three years. So when people start talking to you about 10% of your income, on an annual basis, the income was more than 20%. Because you see, they had to go down, what, three times a year, right? And don't come empty-handed, okay? Come to pay the tithe to the Levite and so forth and so on. So the tithing would be more than 10% of the law to these Israelites. It would be greater than 20%. And then every third year, they had to come up and lay up in order for the poor to have what they needed, Okay? All right, we're not going to go into all that because there's the planting of the fields and leaving the corner thereof and all that stuff. We could go into that, but we're not. So what I want to do in closing, I want you to see now, if you understood what I just said out of those verses, and if you can read and comprehend, you can. Now you can understand Malachi. You'll never be mixed up in Malachi again. Because this is what was not happening in Malachi by those priests and when he says, robbing the Lord. Let me ask you this question. If we give out of bounty, we give liberally, we give as a gift, not grudgingly, not out of necessity, can we rob the Lord? No, because it's a gift. If God commands that we give it and we hold back, are we robbing the Lord? Yes, and that's what they were doing. Now you understand Malachi, all right? Not from a preacher's perspective, but from God's perspective, you understand. So thumb up to Malachi real quick and we'll, we'll finish off at Malachi. And trust me that I did fight a little bit about how much of this tithing thing I was going to show you because we could go really, really in depth and stay in it for a long time. I don't think that's necessary because of where we've been and how much study we've done in time past way back before we got to this facility. So that's why I chose not to 
uh, belabor some of those other things. But you do see that that tithe was to Israel, right? And you do see that it was for the Levites. It was for the family and the festival. And it was for the poor as a welfare system. So when we come up to Malachi, if you understand the principle of tithing that was given back in Deuteronomy and Numbers, then Malachi should not be something that's a maze for you to work your way through. All right? Because I want to say this, and I want to say it out of a good spirit and a good heart. If, if someone you know, or you're sitting in a place, or someone's watching this video, and a man is coming back to Malachi to put you under the law of tithing, you simply need to show him the truth of the Word of God out of love, spirit of meekness, and so forth, and maybe he'll receive it, or you just need to get away. Okay? Because it's not for you. All right? Now, I know it's not for you. Verse 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. All right? So it's, it's to Israel. I don't doubt that because it's what the Bible says. Okay? All right? Now, here's what I want you to see, though. I want you to see what the priests were actually doing. You found the covenant back in Numbers, and you found the covenant back in Deuteronomy. Thou shalt. All right? So now look down in verse 6. Chapter 1, verse 6 of Malachi. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, watch, O priest, who you think he's talking to? Priest. No priest today, right? Somebody say amen. No priest today. That despise my name. Now watch, and you say, wherein have we despised thy name? Now watch what he tells them. You offered polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? Watch. In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, the priest said, forget what God said about what ought to be offered. We'll offer what we want to offer. Now they're breaking God's covenant. And now they're making God's, as if God's, God's table is for them to decide where God has already spoken the word, what shall be. What God has said is what God means. When God said it under law, God meant it under law, right? And so here they have broken that covenant. Watch verse 8. Watch what they're doing. And you offer the blind for sacrifice. What was from the beginning of the sacrifice, even when we go back to the Passover in Exodus, what, was they, what were they to do? Make sure that that lamb was without spot and it was without blemish before they ever offered it up. Right? And so here, they're offering up the blind for sacrifice. Is it not evil? You know it's evil. God has said not to do it this way. He has said do it another way. Now watch. And if you uh, offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? See that? Offering up blind animals, animals that had deficiency, totally against what God had ordained. All right? Watch what he says. Offer it now unto thy governor, will he be pleased? God says, if you even offer that over to the sect of, of government, what's he going to say about it? He's not going to accept it, and you're expecting God Almighty to accept what I've already told you was different. Nope, he's not going to accept it. Now what? Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. All right, so the law says, do be blessed. Don't do accordingly and be what? Cursed. So here we're going to have this, this issue with them polluting and making the table of the Lord contemptible by not doing as the law had instructed them to do. So now look at chapter 2. In chapter 2, can you determine without me who he's speaking to? And now, O ye priest. Right? <laughs> I know a grace church gets sarcastic sometimes, but as priest, he's speaking to priest, folk. It's not you. It won't ever be about you. It's priest. All right? This commandment is for you, the priest. All right? If you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory into my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. And I will curse your blessings, yea, I have cursed them already. You see the curse there, right? Do, be blessed, don't do, don't hearken to the Lord, and be cursed. He said, I've already cursed it. Now, because you do not lay it to what? 
you do not lay it to heart what I've told you previously. Okay? Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. Do you see the curse? Right? All right, now watch the cause. Look at Malachi 3. Look at Malachi 3. Now, these are the verses that we hear most often preached to the church, the body of Christ, in order to get you guilty enough to give 10% of your income to a building. These are the verses. What they didn't do with you, they didn't share with you chapter 1 and chapter 2, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and all that information to say this is really what it's about. Okay? There's money in this, they say, and it belongs to the Lord. I mean, I don't have that principle in the dispensation of the grace of God. God don't need my money. He is not going to ever stand in a welfare line. And He is never going to be without. If I built a building big enough, a warehouse to stack $100 bills from now to the time I leave this earth, God's okay without it. Right? Food line's not on His shopping list. Right? He don't need a car. He don't need any of that business. Well, He needs your faithfulness. Yeah, to the mysteries of Christ. All right, so watch here in 3.7. Well, look at 3.6. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances. You see that? They've turned away from what God said do, back in Deuteronomy, back in Numbers. You're gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Now watch verse 8. And this is one of you. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now how were they robbing God? Because they weren't doing what they should be doing and laying up in His storehouse those things that He had commanded out of Deuteronomy 14, all right, that the system that God had set forth in place, and by the way, you have a similar system in this world today, right? You have taxes that goes to the government, right? And then, of course, it's getting less and less and maybe more and more in other ways. There's a welfare system out there, okay? And then there's all these things. It's a principle of government, right? And God had government, and this is the way it worked. So they're robbing him because they're not bringing these things so that God's storehouse will be full so that those order, um, orphans, widowers, and all those, the strangers and such, would have, right? So the welfare system had broken down because they had left God's ordinances to do what God had commanded of them. I will not leave today without telling you this story. So bear with me. My wife and I sat in an assembly, and I'm not giving a name or denominational whatever, but the preacher of that assembly, he got to the point with tithing that it got absolutely ridiculous. Now let me tell you what he did one morning, and if he were to hear this, he'll know who he is, but I won't call him by name. He passed out an offering plate to all the people that were there in that Sunday teaching. And in that offering plate were the little square nails. And I don't know, Leonard may know the name of the square nails, but it was like a square nail flat at the top. And halfway down that nail was painted red. So the offering plate went around and everybody picked up a nail that had the red paint on it, right? And so when it's all said and done, everybody's got a nail. And then he goes, it's like the Malachi. Here. And he begins to put this guilt on us. And the, the red paint on the nail referenced Jesus Christ and his death and his shed blood for us. So now we're on the guilt trip. You know, he did this for you, and you can't give 10% of your income. And so forth and so on, to guilt people into giving. And I simply looked over at her and said, we're not giving. I'm done. Because I'd already seen this truth. Malachi's not written to me. Malachi's not about me. And I'm not to give 10% based on grudgingly or of necessity. Right? I'm to give as I purposed in my heart. That could be more than 10%. Okay? It can be less than 10%. And if you've got bills to pay, unlike what they teach you, pay me first and God will pay your bills, that's a recipe for bankruptcy. 
That's a recipe for having a tow truck hook up to your car. That's a recipe for getting thrown out of your house, right? Well, I've done it and ain't never. Well, that's because you're the preacher and they're paying you, right? And if that church don't work, God will lead you to a bigger one. I understand how it works. I've never heard one of those preachers get led to a smaller church. It's always a bigger church with a bigger congregation and more benefit, right? So I couldn't leave without telling you that story today because that's how tithing works in assemblies. It's about guilt. You're out here buying Christmas gifts for your family. You ought to be throwing that money in this plate so I can buy Christmas gifts for my family. Yeah, you know how it works, right? So watch here, and back in Malachi, you're cursed with a curse, and you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Is he talking about the body of Christ, or is he talking about a nation? He's talking about a nation, right? Do you know there's no nation in the body of Christ? Did we establish when we first started that Christ has already redeemed us from the curse of the law? So can this in any way, any manner, be talking about the body of Christ? It most certainly cannot be. And they can stand on their head and scream it is. I don't care. If I ride by their assemblies next Sunday and they're preaching from the chimney that this is to me, I'm not buying it because I've already established it's not. All right, now watch what he says. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. Now that's BB&T if you're under a denominational tithing system. The storehouse is the bank. All right. I'm going to say something that I believe it's okay if an assembly takes care of its preacher pastor. Okay. That, that don't work here because I'm not that guy looking for you to, to give me money. Okay. I prefer it the way I have it. I work, right? I have my money. You got your money. Okay. We do this based on what we're doing to get the truth out. Okay. It's not about me having money. It's not about you paying me. Okay. Because I might want to buy something that you don't like. And if it's your money, you might call me about it. If I buy it with my money and you call me, I'll just tell you you don't like it. That's up to you. I bought it with my money. Okay? So with that being said, he says, now the storehouse. So the storehouse is not the church's bank account. I do not believe that God ever, ever insisted upon and approves of church assemblies having millions of dollars squirrel back in the bank. And people all around that community hurting, whatever it may be. I, don't, I just, just don't believe it. Right? If, a, if a congregation is big enough to take care of its preacher, its pastor, and, and I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, we're not a 5013C here, so anything that you want to count off your taxes, verify that it's okay that you do so. Uh, we're just a free giving people. Don't ask you for a dollar. You know, we, for, for a long time we did pass plates, you know, for the gifts. We quit doing that. There's a box at the back. Uh, if you give, you give it out of your heart as God has purposed. You don't do it grudgingly. You do it not of necessity. There it is. But the storehouse here is nothing more than the place where God had established, as He said He would in Deuteronomy and Numbers, a place of His name, okay, where they would take this and put it there for the purpose in which God had attended. And they had left those ordinances. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse. There may be meat in my house. And prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, I will not open, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that uh, there shall not be room enough to receive it. There's people who gave tithes forever and they're still waiting for that window to open. They're in poverty, paying some preacher or some church waiting for the window. Jesus is going to pull that cord any day now. Folks, that's almost gambling. That's almost like the lottery. I'm going to put this money in the slot machine. I'm going to pull that stick. And, you know, old sevens might line up just perfectly. I walk out of here and never need money again. That's almost gambling. It wasn't gambling here. It's the truth of God here. It's what he told him to do. Do and be blessed. Don't do and be cursed. So it's not that here. But today, for you to play under this principle and to operate under this principle, it's almost like gambling. Okay? Because that blessing to you is not physical. You've got the spiritual blessings of Christ. Okay? And He's blessed us to be able to go work. He's blessed us to be able to go make a living. He's blessed us that if we are physically able, and if we're we're not, then that's where the body comes in. We help one another and so forth and so on. All right? All right? He's going to open up the windows of heaven and just pour out this great big blessing. And, you know, that's true back here, guys. It really is. But how many people today are under preachers believing this is what God's doing today? Give me 10%, you know, 
you drive a Vega to church, he drives a Cadillac. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's got a house with four bedrooms, you've got one with two. Well, he's the man of God. He's not the priest. He didn't replace the priest, folks. Uh, he, he's preacher, he's pastor, right? All right, now watch uh, verse 11. And I will rebuke, rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he, he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast forth the fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations, now look, all nations, plural, shall call you blessed, Israel. For you shall be a lightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So Israel would be the blessed nation and all other nations would call Israel blessed by them working and doing as God said do by the time. All right. So in those verses in Malachi, in, uh, we see the priest polluting the table of the Lord. In chapter 2, we see the curse. Chapter 3, we see the cause because they were robbing God from doing what God had commanded they do. And in verse 4, we see the cure. What is the cure for Israel, as he just said in verse 10? Return to the tithing principle that I gave you in Deuteronomy 14. Return to that, and I'll return to you. Because that is what I started with in verse 22, 14. Thou shalt. So when Israel returns to the ordinances of God and doing what God said do, God says, then I will return to you and I will give unto you accordingly and bless you accordingly. So there's the cure. Would it be a cure for us to turn and go back to the tithing law and principle? No. It would be a curse for us to do so because we're not under the law. Right? Well, you become part of this when you got saved. No, you didn't. Quit lying to people you didn't, right? You became a member of the church, the body of Christ, when you got saved. Where there is no Jew, there is no Greek, there is no bond, there is no free, there is no male, there is no female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And the principle of giving today, and you should give, and you should want to give, is the fact that God has blessed you, and by that blessing that you have, that you have extra, you have bounty, that you give to the work of the Lord. And let me say this. You can go out here and help someone who doesn't have. And don't let the church make you feel guilty over that. We experienced that. We gave our money to someone who was health ridden, who couldn't work. We helped them and got ridiculed in the church we were in because we didn't bring that money to the church. Instead, we stepped out and we helped that person that needed help. You see, you have the freedom to help someone who's in need. All right? And if we can't keep the lights on here, we can't keep the air on here, we can't keep the heat on here, we'll do something different. Maybe Bojangles can pay their bills, and we'll meet there, okay, over a cup of coffee. So, it, you know, the tithing, folks, is a law given to Israel to abide by. You are free from that curse, okay? So if you're able to stand this morning, stand. Hopefully, maybe you got something out of that teaching. If you didn't get anything out of it, don't tell me about it. If you did, tell somebody else about it. All right? So let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for today. We're thankful for your word, right to the body. We're thankful for all that you do for us. We give you the praise, honor, and glory for the love that you showed for us on Calvary. Uh, when you put your son there to die for our sin, how humbling it is that he died for our sin, shed his blood to wash away all that we had done wrong, everything that was against us, nailing it to his cross, you buried him, but you raised him up on the third day for our justification. That if we would just by simple faith trust and believe what he did, what he accomplished, that we could be saved. We love you for it. We thank you for it. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. And everyone did say, Amen. Amen.